This podcast of the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs is sponsored by AAA Heating and Air. The premier HVAC company in the Midlands is growing. Are you a top HVAC technician? AAA Heating and Air is looking for dedicated applicants to fill their fast-growing service department with top-notch HVAC technicians. If you're the best, then they want you. If you're ready to stop working and start a career, you can earn up to $100,000 plus a year at AAA Heating and Air. Quality candidates will have at least two years' experience and a good driving record. Benefits include top industry salaries, commission on service and unit sales, set call limits, company-provided take-home vehicle and gas card, company-provided cell phone and tablet, help, dental, and vision benefits, 401k retirement plan with company match and scaled PTO based on length of service. Contact Roy and Dana Finley at 803-677-1500 or check out their job postings on Facebook or ZipRecruiter. Triple A air when you need us. Triple A heating and air. It's the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour, presented by Firehouse Subs, founded by Firemen, with Chris Clark. The 2007 South Carolina class was, at that time, sixth in the country and fourth in the SEC, which is amazing. Wes Mitchell. You know, I think if you're South Carolina, you're you're aiming to, to at least be at 50%. Then in theory, you're adding talent, you're getting better, you're putting yourself in a position to compete. And Tyler Head. It's been a great week for South Carolina. On the recruiting front, still certainly plenty to talk about. On the home of the Gamecocks, 107.5 The Game. And welcome in to the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs. Here on 107.5 The Game, Tyler Head, Chris Clark, and just coming in in the nick of time, Wes Mitchell, on your Friday edition of today's show. And uh, I I told Wes we were going to sit in silence until he came in here so fortunately he was able to make it in right as the right as the show starts but uh, i should stay ha- happy uh cinco de mayo guys taco time it's always taco time yes i agree i'm just gonna mm-hmm. say i made it i had a uh breakfast burrito for breakfast my daughter and i so we got off to a good start for cinco de mayo and we will continue the theme throughout the day what would you put in that thing uh, these were frozen ones, oh. so it, like it said what was in it on the package. Once I opened it up, it was not really clear what it's those tr- items it, were. It's just all mashed together. Yeah, it was kind of mystery, ma- mystery it, stuffing. It, this was not a gourmet breakfast burrito by any means, but it got the job done. It was actually pretty good. It wasn't bad. So, so I, I posed this question earlier. What is the better day to have something like Cinco de Mayo? Is it Friday or is it Saturday? This Friday. It's Friday? Yeah. Friday. Because I feel like with Friday, you have that anticipation of like, you work all day, like, all yeah. right, when I get off, go out, go out, you know, change clothes, go out with friends, tacos, margaritas, whatever it may be. And then you have like the whole weekend to kind of celebrate it, right? Or, or possibly recover. But, True. but yes, Friday, like you, you get done with the work day and it's kind of that, that side, like go have happy hour, have right. some good time. So I, I definitely am, I'm all for Friday, Cinco de Mayo. Let, let me just say... Might be a controversial opinion. Here. Oh, no. Here we go. Cinco de Mayo. And bear with me. Let me finish. Not my favorite holiday to celebrate. Okay. That's not controversial. Reason being, all of the restaurants that I would enjoy every single other day other than Cinco de Mayo are now packed with people. So, like, I will eat taco. We can have tacos on the 4th of May, the 6th of May, the 10th of May, the 15th of, like, I'm all here for the tacos. But the restaurants that have the best tacos are just slammed. This is true. This is true. On Cinco de Mayo. Yeah, we, we have actually done that before. We've done, okay, this isn't, this day, maybe we just have a conflict. Maybe it's exactly what you said. Like, this place is going to be absolutely insane let's go on thursday let's go on saturday we, we've done that before that's acceptable yeah no problems with that so i was talking to colin because he's on his way up to lexington when he was doing our show uh from nine to ten and you know i asked him how he was going to celebrate and he's like i'll find a taco bell along the way i was like yeah nothing mm-hmm. screams cinco de mayo more than a crunch wrap supreme and baja blast mm-hmm. uh shout out to my wife she can make a homemade crunch wrap supreme and it's Ooh. really good probably a slightly healthier uh, don't ask Colin any food takes anymore, though. Yeah, I might, I might, I might need the recipe on that, Chris. Okay, I can hook you up. Yeah, Colin is cut off from food <laughs> takes for the rest of time. He is going to cover a little baseball, though. 
He is. A uh, very important series this weekend. Gamecocks taking on uh, Kentucky up there in Lexington. And, you know, uh, I was talking about this with Tommy Moody in the last hour. You're kind of similarly getting a, a team like you faced against Auburn last weekend that's right on there on the edge of the postseason, on the out, you know, not on the outside, but kind of right there teetering on the line where they have a lot to prove against a top ranked team. And we saw what Auburn was able to do last weekend. And you're going to get another good shot from Kentucky this weekend. Well, if they've already spoken to Colin Taylor and Tommy Moody, I don't know if Chris and I have anything to add. <laughs> Can you just I was, replay? I was hoping their... that um, maybe Tommy hadn't joined yet <laughs> so we could at least get in before him. Maybe he was coming on later. But no, obviously, massive series for South Carolina. And, and aren't they all at this point? I mean, I, I think... Now, to me, the biggest thing for Carolina is just hang on for dear life for these final few weeks of SEC play and get as many guys back healthy for your postseason push. Like, I, I think you are firmly in the sort of, like, you have earned the right by winning so many games to this point that you don't really have to grind it out in order to, to get in postseason play. Now, you, wa- you want that top eight seed. Don't get me wrong. Um, you know, I, I think they've put themselves in a good spot for that. They've put themselves in a great spot to host a regional as long as you don't just completely flame out down the stretch. So I think that if you're Carolina at this point, you're not going to rush a guy back if he's sort of teetering on being able to play or not being able to play. And um, the, the real thing is to just get healthy and find wins here or there. Not that I think you just concede, but... <laughs> You know, this is a, a situation where they have so many injuries, and so many of these injuries are the type you start talking about hamstrings and uh, soft tissue issues. To still Will Muschamp's phrase, if you uh, he's got a leg, yeah, he's got a leg. <laughs> but for real, if you you can you can think that Hammy feels amazing when you're sitting on the bus ride. You can get out there, you can stretch it out. You'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm good to go. I'm ready to come back. And then the second you make a sudden movement, you realize, oh, it's it's not back. And then you maybe set yourself back a week, two weeks, three. You're just adding on to the time it's going to take. So, you know, if, if you're Carolina, the guys that are dealing with things like that, um, you know, you go back to McGillis, who obviously, you know, had the broken bone, but he's going to be trying to get his timing back. I think getting him back in these next few weeks and just letting him possibly start to get his timing back um, before the postseason push would be very beneficial. So to me, yeah, you're trying to win games, but there is more at stake here. And looking at the injuries, you mentioned McGillis. He and Lee Croy are probably the two closest to coming back and hopefully we can get them back here in these next couple of weeks obviously Noah Hall it seems like at this point that might be a done deal for the season but you know we're still um, kind of going week to week with that to see if they say anything else and then Braylon Wimmer's still out we don't really have a timetable for his return yet but at least for McGillis and Lee Croy's sake you could theoretically have both those guys back pretty soon yeah and that, and that will be huge right now you know you're, you're still scrapping and battling and, and the good news for this team is that despite the injuries that have mounted They've done some great work this year, not being at full strength, which is really helps kind of bolster their their resume and keep them in contention to really potentially do something special, you know, in the postseason. So, yes, the Auburn loss, the series loss was not great. We we kind of talked about that, a variety of factors that kind of, kind of finally caught up, not playing well, the injuries. Your starting pitching finally let you down when it really had not all year. All those things kind of came together and added up to a series loss. But but Wes made a great point after that series and that the fact that you were able to sweep number three Georgia means that in that Florida. six game Florida. Yeah, I don't know why I said Georgia. Did that too. The fact that you were able to sweep Florida, you, you go four and two in that six game stretch. So you can look at it that way. But I do look at this Kentucky series, guys. And, you know, you, you win the, the midweek against Winthrop. You take care of business there. But your remaining SEC series to reset those at Kentucky, then you got to go to at Arkansas. So your next six SEC games all on the road, you've got midweek sandwiched in between those, North Florida and Charlotte, both at home. And then you host Tennessee. And Tennessee's, you know, heated up. They're, they're playing a good bit better. 
I do think this is an important series for them to go and win at Lexington. Go get two of three to stay on the right track and then hope for getting some of these other guys back fully healthy to have as as strong a lineup as you can possibly have to go play Arkansas, to go play Tennessee. It's not, I mean, what, what they've done is not typical. You know, number one, it's not typical on any roster, in any college baseball program. What they've done this year has been tremendous, just full strength, however you slice it anyway. But to do it not being at full strength for a good portion of the year, I think even more impressive. So you want to go out, you want to get this series and then be in the best possible shape because there could be some hiccups, healthy or not, right? Yeah. You're going to play a really good Arkansas team at a very difficult place to play. You're going to play Tennessee at home, but a Tennessee team with a lot of talent who's improved a lot, was one of the best teams in the country last season. So this is, especially with what we saw against Auburn, this is, this is a, a series that you want to go and you want to win. Yeah, and I was looking at the D1 projections for uh, the postseason now, as of right now, and obviously things can change over these next couple of weeks, they would have obviously South Carolina hosting a regional against all in-state teams. So they will be hosting Clemson, Wofford, and uh, Davidson. And again, things can change over the course of the next couple of weeks, but uh, a lot of familiarity there with those opponents uh, should that be the case. Biggest thing that I'm uh, interested to see is uh, what happens tonight with uh, you know Will Sanders getting back on the mound after a pretty rough outing last week and and we know it's been an up and down season for him and you know the the mental aspect of it certainly comes into account and seeing if he can uh you know get back on the horse and and be back to true form this week after a bad outing last weekend yeah and i I put kentucky honestly on a different tier than than auburn i mean this is a team they're fourth in the rpi they're 11 and 10 in sec play 30 and 13 overall uh let's see 15-11 15-11 and 11 record as far as quad one games. And for South Carolina, you know, Carolina's number two in the live RPI right now on warrennolan.com. This is an opportunity because we know the RPI rewards road games. I mean, you'd get rewarded just for playing them. You know, you <laughs> yeah. don't even have to win them. Yeah. But, uh, Got swept. You move yeah. up. Yeah, so, but, but for Carolina... When, winning, you, you have to avoid getting swept. You know, when yeah. when one, Carolina fans are not going to be happy with that. And again, I'm not trying to concede, but I, I think this. I think you're about to play nine tight baseball games for these final three series, and they can go any number of ways. You just have to kind of um, avoid the worst case scenario. I, I think because you're. So you you got Kentucky, again, they're number four right now in the live RPI. Again, that's at Kentucky. Arkansas is six. And Tennessee, as they make their push, is now 16. So as long as you can have a solid record in these final three weeks, you're going to hold, like you've built up enough goodwill, you're going to hold your spot in the RPI and really create yourself a, a nice tournament resume a nice host seed resume. Now, are you going to be a top eight? I think the one thing you're fighting there, guys, is that, again, RPI RPI is not everything, but Wake Forest is number one right now, but then number two, three, four, five, six, and eight are all SEC schools. So at some point, there's going to be a cutoff where they say, right or wrong, we know they do this. They're going to say, we're not going to have six SEC top eight host seeds. Yeah. So what what's the cutoff on how many top eight SECs there are? And if you're South Carolina, you actually may be getting to a point where you're splitting hairs between being a top eight and not based on something that's really not even in your power. And and then at, at some point, how much does not playing that final LSU game potentially become a factor in that? Who, who, which SEC teams are in that top eight? You said Kentucky was four? Yeah, so you've got South Carolina two, Arkansas LSU three, Kentucky four, Vandy five, Arkansas <laughs> six. Then you go to the ACC with Duke at seven, Florida at eight. Where's Tennessee? Is that easily accessible? They're 16. Yeah, I mean. So you, you do have a little bit. I know we're splitting hairs. There's like a million baseball teams. So. Uh, but you do have a little bit of sort of a gap after 
after Florida at eight. So you have six of the top eight or SEC schools. Then you have a gap. Um, Clemson's actually checking in at 12. And, uh, but you have a gap before you get to the next SEC schools. Tennessee at 16. Surprisingly, um, especially considering people bet against them, Alabama at 17. Oh, that was a that was a great pun. So, y'all, everybody we were, betting against Alabama. We were we were going off the air when that news was breaking yesterday. But man, that's a bad situation. Yeah, it's getting it's getting a little bit worse. Uh, we can touch on that a little bit more on the uh, other side. Uh, South Carolina on the road this weekend for baseball. They do return home on Tuesday, taking on North Florida. If you want a pair, well, we of got tickets. tickets? To that game, yes. I, I pulled from my own stash of tickets for this. <laughs> How nice of you. Yes, it is. These are for the Gamecock game, not the Georgia game, right? That is correct. Okay. Yes. All right. My own personal stash. I shelled out all, <laughs> all the money people gave me at my wedding. I just went out and bought a bunch of Gamecock baseball tickets. To and North I'm Texas. Them what? To North Florida. <laughs> North Florida. North Florida, <laughs> yes. So, yes, that game coming up on Tuesday at 4 o'clock. If you want a pair of tickets to that, be called number 5 right now at 803 404 6100. We'll be right back. It's the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour. 1075, the game. All right, you know what time it is and what day it is. It is Friday. So, yes, it is Cinco de Mayo, but it's also Firehouse Friday. And so that gives you an opportunity to check out one of the subs that maybe you have not had yet, and that is the Jamaican jerk turkey. It is absolutely fantastic, and you can get it. At every single one of the Midlands Firehouse Subs locations, 14 of them in all. And there's so many ways to get the Jamaican Jerk Turkey. It is the sub of the day at Firehouse Subs. It's $7.99 for a medium, $5.99 for a small. Go to firehousesubs.com. You can find a firehouse. Just really cool interactive map there. You can type in your zip code, your city, and it'll tell you where the closest one is to you if you can't just drive around and find one, which you probably can. So go to firehousesubs.com. You can find the firehouse closest to you and use the Rapid Rescue to place your order, or you can download the Firehouse Subs app to start earning rewards on your Firehouse Subs purchases. That's firehousesubs.com. Sub of the day, it is the Jamaican Jerk Turkey. Talk more about the Alabama baseball situation on the other side or listen to the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour. Presented by Firehouse Subs, 107.5 The Game. It's the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour. Presented by Firehouse Subs. Founded by Firemen with Chris Clark, Wes Mitchell, and Tyler Head. On your home of the Gamecocks. 1075, the game. Um, well, you know, I just kind of told him business as usual, man. You know, you guys have done a great job all year of taking care of business. You go out, you play your game, and um, that's what we're going to do tonight, right? Nothing changes. Uh, everything that we want to accomplish is right here in front of us. You guys have been playing your tails off, and we're going to get out and play our tails off again tonight, and that was the, you know, basic message, and we didn't, not you know, didn't really say a whole lot. And welcome back into the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour, presented by Firehouse Subs here on 107.5 The Game. Tyler West and Chris along with you. That was the voice of Jason Jackson, the interim baseball coach for the University of Alabama after they picked up the 11-2 to win last night over Vanderbilt at home. And obviously the questions around that team revolve around them firing Brad Bohannon yesterday in reference to this gambling situation that took place during last weekend's game against uh, LSU on uh, Friday night. We've learned a few more details about this uh, since it broke yesterday while we were literally on the air and uh you know there is now apparently surveillance video that shows somebody in this sports book up in cincinnati communicating directly with coach bohannon while this game was going on and this person was in there placing bets um we don't know the exact number figure of what that bet was but it's being rumored in the neighborhood of six figures which you know that's that's going to set off some alerts well all right lots to unpack here i think first of all the interim coach there, Jason Jackson, man, that was a coach speak answer. Yeah. Because, <laughs> yeah, they, the coaches may not have said much, but can y'all imagine a freaking locker room after you find out your coach has been betting on you indirectly, allegedly, to lose games? Yeah. Like, lo- locker rooms and can y'all imagine the parents' reaction to this? Parents have reactions to their kid pitching the eighth inning instead of the ninth. So you're telling me the parents aren't freaking the you-know-what out over this, and rightfully so right? in this case. So, yeah, he gave the 
the answer you're supposed to give as a new coach trying to take over and not create any more headlines for Alabama sports at this point. But, yeah, coach speak all the way. Second of all, um, I didn't really – I didn't realize until I started reading on this, or I didn't think about it, I guess. College baseball, normal SEC games – don't really generate betting action. So mm-hmm. if you throw a $100,000 bet on an Alabama LSU baseball game in the middle of the season, that in itself is going to raise some suspicion. And then additionally, how good are the cameras at <laughs> this uh, you know, sports book? that they were able to zoom in on his text messages during the game. And fourth of all, I guess that's what number I'm on, how how just messed up are your priorities if you're this coach at an SEC school, you're getting paid pretty well, I'm sure, that you're texting this other dude from the dugout during an in-conference game. Yeah, it's one of those things like, okay, let's let's just say he... If allegedly. It, allegedly. <laughs> Let's all, say all let's say he won a hundred thousand dollars on this bet, which again we don't know what the number figure is. It was high. Let's say he won a hundred thousand dollars. Is it worth risking your career for? Because he's obviously been fired from Alabama, and let's just say he was making I don't know four hundred thousand dollars as the head baseball coach there, or somewhere in that neighborhood. That's gone. Uh, you're going to have a tough time getting hired by any other college program. You'll at this never point. be hired again. Um, yeah, so, I mean, was was the one bet, and who knows how many bets he's made up to this point. Was he, it worth he, risking your career over? He would maybe be hired again if he was, like, the greatest college. You, you know how, like, people are like, all right, well, who's who's going to hire Urban Meyer next? You know, cause like, maybe somebody will do Rick it. Patino it, it, keeps Rick Patino keeps getting jobs. Like, it, conti- it continues happening, like, if you win, but, I mean, he's not that. And so, Wes, you stole, like, basically all my points, so I don't appreciate it, but, um, <laughs> but... I, I thought of the camera thing, too, and I ha- have many questions. So, like, you see on the movies, and even if you've ever been in a casino in Vegas, like, you see the I mean, cameras absolutely everywhere. So, obviously, they're zooming in, like, on cards and, you know, trying to see exactly what people are doing. But, like, but he just sitting there with his phone and just see that it says Brad on it, or does it say Brad Bohannon on his phone, and that's how they figure it out. But my, my biggest question is, so what was... Bohannon's motivations. Do, do we know that yet? Like, not for anything. Cash I've seen. money. Well, or and I'm not like I'm not trying to defend him on on this or anything. I'm just seriously wondering: was this somebody who was like, "Hey, man, um, how 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 are you looking? How's the picture looking today?" You yeah. know, and then he just texts him back, "He's out," and then the guy's like, "All right, I'm going to lay down 150 on this then." It's probably not that, but like, is is that what it was? That's possible. Or is this a scheme of like, yeah. hey man, wink, wink? I, I feel like it's got. That's not a fireable offense. If he was just texting his buddy, and then his but he, he's not responsible for his buddy and his actions after, right? I yeah, like. I mean, I wouldn't think so, but but I am just like how. But how could you? How could you hold him accountable? For telling his buddy, my I, I tend out. to think it's not that, but I'm, I'm just bringing it up. Just no, it's, to, it's possible. The purposes it, it, of th- there's so much to this we don't know yet that's going to come out. Um, that's a possibility. Uh, to answer your question, uh, or you you mentioned, um, you know, how much money gets bet on college baseball? David Purnham of ESPN, he's like the betting insider, was talking yesterday. He said he talked to one sports book in reference to this specific game, where a total of thirty five dollars had been placed on it prior to this. <laughs> And then somebody goes and lays down, let's just say a hundred thousand dollars on it. Like, yeah, that's gonna it's gonna set off some alarms. One of the biggest online sports books in the world, who is not a sponsor, but they they said they had no bets on this. Yeah, and it's it's something that just about and, everybody and, uses. And, and look, there there's plenty of degenerate gamblers out there that would <laughs> bet you if that cat's gonna make it across the street or not or something like that. But college foot, uh, college baseball is such a niche sport that. The regular season, it doesn't get much attention. Now, yes, once you get in the postseason in Omaha and all that stuff, um, it certainly gains some steam. But a regular season Friday night game between Alabama and LSU, it's usually not going to move the needle too much. Well, and two things 
So off of that, AL.com, an industry insider, unnamed, uh, that they talked to said that if somebody put down $5,000 on a college baseball game, that would be large. So that's probably, it's kind of like, my first thing was like, man, how did they find that? Well, that's your first starting point. A, a bet of anything on a college baseball game. If we went and we all flew to Vegas after this and went and laid down 200 bucks on the Gamecocks Kentucky this weekend, we might have the the pit boss (laughs) coming out and to an office. Excuse me, sir. You know, I need to talk to you. So that's number one. Um, Now, back to my point earlier. Here's what the the NCAA rules say, and and this is on the part of what exactly did Bohannon do? What what were his motivations? How deep was he in this? Uh, This is from the AL.com story. Participation in wagering activities, you're prohibited from participation in wagering activities and from providing info to individuals involved in or associated with any type of of wagering activities. So that's kind of broad. I mean, arguably, and lawyers can sort this out. They need a bunch of billable hours to do it. You could say, hey, you gave that dude info on your starting pitcher. I'm just making this up, right, because that's been talked about. Their starting pitcher was scratched about an hour before the game, their ace with back tightness. So, again, was it as simple as their coach? And and their coach might have known, or or maybe he didn't know that this guy was about to go place that bet. That's kind of my question. I tend to think, as you said, Wes, that in the course of the NCAA investigating this, Alabama investigating this, it seems more likely that they came across some information that indicated that the head coach was more involved than just saying yes or no to whether or not his pitcher is going to go that night. I'm guessing that the guy, we don't have a name, do we, for the guy who's making the alleged bets, but um, I'm I'm guessing this guy placed some bets. They set off the alarms. So then that's when you start shooting in the super high-res camera. Hey, (laughs) we're watching this guy. This is target number one today. Let's watch him. Then Alabama gets alerted. They say, hey, we want to check check your phone. They check the phone and... Didn't delete the messages. You're caught, you know, red-handed, basically. And I, I will say this, like... Sports people, to Chris's point, if you're if you're a great player or coach, people will sort of do the mental gymnastics <laughs> to kind of forgive a lot. But in sports, you know, we have unwritten rules. We have kind of the social contract. Yep. Betting against your own team is like bad look. It's like talking about your mama, basically. Yeah. Like it's like yeah. that is up there as one yeah. of. The absolute worst things you can possibly do in any sport, in any level, like such a disrespect to the guys you recruited to your baseball team. So it's, it's ironic this bet was placed in Cincinnati at the Reds ballpark of all places. <laughs> yes. Well, right. and to to that point, Pete Rose has been banned. Right. He's ostracized. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no Hall of Fame for him. And never supposedly never bet against his team. Right. So, yeah, and, and, this is even worse. But And that point, though, Wes, is why possibly, again, I have no idea what the conversation was like, but you could make the argument that even if he had somebody who asked about the status of the pitcher or maybe Bo Hannon just said, um, let me update my buddy on our on our pitcher, and, and that guy then used said information to bet against Alabama, it's just a bad look. Like, if that's the extent of it is still a terrible look, but it's probably, again, a lot more than that. And there's a lot more information to come out on this in the days and weeks to come, but it's still taking my cake as the most bizarre story of 2023. All right, we'll hit another break, come back, and talk a little bit more uh, Gamecock football on the other side. You're listening to the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour. It's by Fire All Subs, 107.5 The Game. It's the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour. 107.5 The Game. I once again want to welcome a brand new sponsor to the show. It is Gold Line Framing. They have custom framing, a gallery, gifts, uh, 511 12th Street. That's West Columbia, South Carolina, 29169. Phone number is 803-739-1337. Give them a follow on Instagram. That's at Gold Line Framing SC. 
in business over 20 years. They're right across from uh, that big cone in the sky in West Columbia. Open Tuesday to Friday, 10 a.m. to 5.30. Open Saturday, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. They have diplomas, original artwork, canvases, jerseys, flags. They can help you with any and all of your... On Florida's Space Coast, we think you can have the best of both worlds. Kind of like right now. Driving at your desk, maybe at the gym, but you're also grooving to some music. Visit us and you'll go to the beach and see a rocket launch or go kayaking and manatee spotting. It's all waiting for you on the only beach that doubles as a launch pad. Plan your adventure today at visitspacecoast.com. It's the Cape Cod Central Takeover Hour. Presented by Firehouse Subs. Founded by Firemen. With Chris Clark, Wes Mitchell, and Tyler Head. On your home of the Gamecocks. 1075 The Game. And welcome back in to the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs here on 107.5 The Game. Tyler West and Chris along with you on this Cinco de Mayo Friday. And, you know, guys, we're just coming off of spring practice, and we've talked plenty about the guys that were able to be early enrollees, the Pup Howards, Lenora Sellers, and, and so many more. Uh, but, you know, we were talking about what we're going to talk about on the show today, and a, a big X factor for this team is the guys that are going to be coming in the next couple of weeks, uh, the summer enrollees and guys that haven't been on campus yet um, and, you know, finding their way to uh, to slot into this roster. Yeah, I wrote about this on Gamecock Central last night, and I always like to sort of take this time to look at some of the incoming guys, Chris, that, you know, kind of with the context of spring ball and what do, what do we know about the roster? What do we know about where the needs are prior to spring And then what do we learn sort of during and after spring? And I think that for the most part, if I were to make a list of of guys, uh, which I did, it probably wouldn't it probably wouldn't change much based on spring. But it kind of did for me a little bit. And the first guy I had on the list, and these weren't really in order. They weren't designed to be in order, but actually probably inadvertently are. Because Vakari Swain, to me, is still the one I circle because he's, for one, just a really good player. And he's an athlete. He could help you so many different ways, I think. Return game, he could help at receiver. But right now, the plan is for him to start out at defensive back. And I, when I look at what they have at defensive back, I think they kind of probably now feel pretty good about how everybody's coming along at safety. I look at that cornerback spot, O'Donnell Fortune, Marcellus Dial. Pretty locked in, I think, as your starters. But behind them, I still think Swain, with a full summer and preseason ball to sort of keep pushing. I mean, is there a scenario where Vakari Swain is pretty quickly like your your next man up, kind of the third guy at cornerback? He's going to have to beat out, what would you say, Isaiah Norris, Mm -hmm. Emory Floyd. Mm -hmm. That's probably his competition. But I'm not – there's a reason Deion Sanders, one of the best cornerbacks (laughs) in – the history of football was pushing for this guy late. And so I, he's still at the top of the list, and I think he's probably got a chance to potentially be that first reserve if he comes in with the right mindset. I was going to actually ask you a little bit of a different question, but along those same lines. Mm-hmm. Is there a scenario where Vakari Swain can not only be next man up, but even midseason starter? be a starter at corner? Because... Like, I, I totally agree with you. Like, when you look at, okay, who, who are your starters at corner? It, you're not sitting here going, we got no idea. You know, mm-hmm. somebody come in and save us. It's not like that. It's Dial and Fortune. And they've both played. Like, Dial played. Man, I went back and looked at the numbers, PFF numbers. He played even more snaps throughout the year than I thought. I knew he played a lot. He played even more, especially down the stretch. Tennessee, Clemson played a ton in those games. Um, and so... You've got some guys that you feel good about, but it it is different than having Cam Smith and Darius Rush. You know, even coming into last year, there's a there's levels. It's a little bit of a I don't know if drop off's the right word, but you probably feel a little bit more questionable about it. And so, if you have some, you, you feel fine with those two. You feel, probably feel pretty good. But my point is, if you bring in somebody who's just wow, this guy's really really good. I don't think that it's so entrenched 
that there's no chance that somebody could come in and, and take a starting spot. Is no, that I, fair? No, I, I agree. And I, I think, you know, we're we're projecting at this point. Mm-hmm. Like, for, for one, any anytime you're talking about the freshmen, which of these guys come in and are just like, well, I'm, I'm in college now. These workouts are hard. Yeah. And there's like a, a, a process. There's nothing wrong with that if you're that guy. But some of these guys will inevitably come in, and Chris and I will start hearing reports, oh, man, that, that guy looks the part. <laughs> or if, every year never fails yeah. within a few weeks of freshmen getting on campus. Now, it's a smaller and smaller group because so many guys went ahead and came in in the spring. But some guys are just built to come right in. And I, I think it's a mindset. Do you come in saying, oh, I'm a freshman, you know, the pressure's not on me right now. Let me just get settled in at my own pace. Or are you one of those guys that comes in and says, I'm here to play, and I don't care if I'm a freshman. I don't care who's in front of me. I don't care any of those things. That part is difficult to predict and project. But from a pure talent standpoint, absolutely. Now, you do hear reports and you see Torian Gray saying things like, OD Fortune is a new man, I think. So... He's always been a talented kid. Putting it all together this year, I think OD is certainly your projected starter. But is there a, a case, is there a timeline where he potentially gets pushed by Vakari? I, I tend to think this is just the way I slot them in my brain personally, Chris. I tend to think it's going to be very hard to unseat a healthy Marcellus Dow. I agree. Now, opposite him is where... I could see that happening. And and if that happens, that's actually probably a good sign because that means Vakari has come in and done everything that's been asked of him. Talent-wise, this kid has everything you're looking for to play early. And we all know guys get banged up. Even if you can avoid the big injury, you're, you, know, you don't go through a single week of the season without there being somebody on the injury report where it's, hey, this guy's banged up or this guy's day-to-day, this guy's missing practice. So, it, is it that he just outright wins the job? Maybe, maybe not. Is it that week four, one of the cornerbacks is bruised up and it's next man up, and next thing we know, Swain's out there starting? I, I think that's it. When you think about it from that context, there's probably a decent chance he ends up getting a start at some point this season. Yeah, and even look back in spring, Shane Beamer talked about this. They had multiple corners out during spring practice. Yeah. Just banged up. And so it, the thing about Swain is not only is there some potential for opportunity, just in general, he's also really good. Like, mm-hmm. Gamecock fans are probably not talking about this guy enough. He's a top 100 player. If you, if you sat here and said he's a receiver, we'd probably be, t- okay, well, they've got some experienced receivers, but he's probably good enough to break in. If you think of him as a DB, same thing. You know, the one thing is a lot of the impact early and a lot of the impact freshmen you see nowadays are early enrollees. It's become more and more common to enroll in January. He's not, but he also plays a position where historically, I don't want to make it seem easy, but you, you can play corner as a freshman. You can play nickel as a freshman. You know, I think about Wes Shy Smith, who I don't think, I don't think Shy was an early enrollee. I'm pretty sure he was summer. If I'm remembering correctly. I, I think that's right yeah. as well. 2017, he was a super talented guy, and he started seven games as a freshman, you know? Um, and it's not like they were super – I mean, they had some good players on the roster at receiver at that time, but he was good enough to come in and play. So, you know, you look at Swain, you look at the talent there, the length, the ability to run, the ball skills, and then the opportunity that that's potentially there. Again, not a wide-open position, but not one that's just – completely and utterly locked down you look at the the fact that there's not tons of proven depth if there are any any injuries i think he's going to have a good opportunity this year you're, you're always looking for that cross section of talented guy too good to keep off the field versus where is the opportunity on the field for him to play and that's one where it certainly kind of matches up so dj braswell is kind of I, I had him and uh nicholas harbour next you know we we've talked a ton about Harbor and how it's important to kind of have realistic expectations for him 
And, you know, Brad, Braswell, Chris, I think my I think my sort of thought on him has shifted a little bit thanks to the guy we had in yesterday, yeah. Carry on Joyner. It, it, so much of his playing time is going to depend on, of course, off top, what we just talked about. What mindset does he come in with? But then, you know, how well does Joyner do? It seems like he's probably going to do pretty well at running back. Who are they able to get from the portal? What injuries happen at what I believe is the most oft injured position among a roster? So many different things that I think could factor into DJ Braswell's playing time this coming season. Yeah, totally agree. Um, I think the outlook is a little bit better than it was in the spring, but there's also some things that we have not yet learned, namely who the staff could be able to land in the portal. How does he adjust to pass pro? All the all those things. Th- there's a lot still left to learn there. I actually have one more player, Wes, that I would add to your list with the caveat that we can hit on on the other side. Yeah, we'll save that for the other side as we come back and wrap up today's edition of the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs on 107.5 The Game. It's the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour. Presented by Firehouse Subs. Founded by Firemen with Chris Clark, Wes Mitchell, and Tyler Head. On your home of the Gamecocks. 107.5 The Game. And welcome back into the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour. Presented by Firehouse Subs. Tyler, Wes, and Chris along with you for a few more minutes. Coming up after us, it's Terry out at Chubby's on location for today's edition of the Halftime Show. But Chris teased it before the break. He has one more name that he wants to add to the list as far as uh, summer enrollees go and guys to look out for. Let me, it's a caveat to it. Okay. Well, can I, can I tell the people my, the two other names yes. that were on yes, the list? Yes, you have not finished then, your list. Okay, Please so do. we'll maybe get into why for mine. But So I had Babalade, uh, Big Tree, Tosin, and I actually, my kind of sleeper was Trovon Ball. So I added two offensive linemen. Even though I know it's a hard position to play for a freshman, I added them because mainly the Jalen Nichols injury now becoming a factor in that conversation. So, Chris, the floor is yours. Yes, so I actually would like to nominate Cam Sandlin from Alabama. Now, you may be saying, Chris, you're an idiot. He is a tight end. And if that is the case for sure, then I will call myself an idiot and say that's that's not going to happen. The, the caveats, the several caveats to this are, this is just a personal theory. There's actually not any info that this would happen. But given the lack of depth at running back, if South Carolina still did not feel good this summer, i.e. maybe they're, you know, Braswell's not coming along as well, maybe the transfer portal has not been as kind to them, maybe there's injuries, et cetera, et cetera. I personally feel like Sandlin is someone you could audition at running back, former high school quarterback, Different type than carry on Joyner. Bigger guy, 6'3", 6'4", 220. But we've seen similar body type guys do it. So I am personally kind of intrigued uh, by that idea. Yeah, and I, I'm a fan of Cam in the first place because of the reasons you gave. He's one of these just tough-nosed Alabama guys. Just You know how some people, Chris, you look at it, you're just like, that's a football player. I feel like Cam is is in that category and was a heck, actually a heck of a high school quarterback. And, you know, I don't think he's quite the guy that's going to play quarterback in in college, but are there still parts of his game that translate to some different positions in college? Probably translates to special teams as well. I think, you know, I'm I'm with you. I I think that would be an under-the-radar thing to keep an eye on. Before we close out, guys, this is switching gears just a little bit, but we do have a little bit of breaking news on women's basketball. Okay. And that is that uh, Dawn mm. Staley has landed a verbal commitment per the prospect's Instagram, posted a commitment graphic from Sakima Walker. So this is a junior college post from uh, Northwest Florida Community College, I believe it is. She's actually actually has an NBA tie, the daughter of M- former NBA champions... Uh, Samaki Walker. She's the reigning JUCO National Player of the Year, averaged almost 17 points and over eight rebounds a game. Uh, formerly, she began her career at Rutgers, um, has a couple years of eligibility remaining. And this is an interesting move, interesting prospect. We know that South Carolina has also been recruiting Nisa Morrow uh, on the transfer portal circuit, but things have not looked very good 
on that front. She took a visit to LSU this past weekend. The indications seem to have her leaning there, but they do pick up this commitment from Walker, who's got size and, again, former junior college player of the year. All right, and there you go. Some breaking news to end out the week for the uh, Gamecock women's basketball team. Well, that'll do it for today's edition of the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour, presented by Firehouse Subs. Tyler West and Chris back with you on Monday. Terry coming up with the halftime show. Live from Chubby's next on 107.5 The Game.